Come and leave it there I was down With no way up And I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well And I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free Oh, 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 oh,
Praise God. This is a day the Lord has made. And we can rejoice and be glad. I know, I know, I know you're ready for the word. So I'm going to ask you to go with me quickly to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And I'm going to read there into your hearing something that happened that changed the course or at least gave us an insight into the heart of of David, of King David. And when you see it, it's going to take your life to a better place. That's right. Get excited. Get happy about this. Allow the flow of God and feel this incident. Now, I'm going to read 2 Samuel chapter 6, and I'm going to read some selected verses from the text. I'm not going to try to read the whole thing, although I will read extensively. So please follow me so you can understand. And again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadad that was in Gibeah and Uzzah. And Ohio, the sons of Abinadad, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadad, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ohio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments, made it of wood, even of harps and psalteries and of timbrels and of cornets and of cymbals. Now go down with me. I'm going to pick up on verse... 11, and the ark of the Lord, verse 11, continued in the house of Obed-Edom Obed at Gittim three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told to King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertained unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom and the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with linen ephod. Verse 14 is where we bring our focus. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. Can we pray? Now, God, we need your help. We need your spirit this morning. You know the trouble that your people are having. You know where everyone is. But, Lord, I can preach no word without you. Please, Father, come and move me out of the way and allow your Holy Spirit, your anointing to flow through me into the houses, into the wherever people are. Let your anointing accompany this message today. And we'll be so careful to give you praise, glory, and honor. And honor. For as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow, and I want you to focus in and hone in on this thought. We're going to speak from the thought, I hope you dance. Be a dancer, not a quitter. Oh, this is going to get good. I hope you dance. Be a dancer, not a quitter. The devil is good about or always constantly is trying to twist the scriptures, twist what God is about, what the kingdom is about, especially in the culture we're living in now, twist the word of God around so that the world gets on his agenda and not God's. 
And he also does that to Christians. What he does is take something that God created for good because we know everything God created was good. And he turns it around for evil. And he gets us all twisted up because if we're not prayed up when this is happening, if we don't have our, our, ourselves prayed up, then it's easy for the devil to even persuade or mess up saints of God. You say, how? All we have to do is call on Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 7, verse 18, 19. You know this text. For I know that in me, that is within my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I can't find. For the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil I don't want to do, that I do. He's describing all of us how sin in our members sometimes gets together with Satan. And Satan agitates our flesh so that we get cheated out of something God has created for blessing. And we miss out. And so things get twisted around until the kingdom of God is no longer benefiting from what God has. And the original purpose of what God created it for left. We can start from the very beginning. We can see the devil. We can see Satan and his evil strategies even in the Garden of Eden. You remember the story. Adam and Eve are in the garden. In chapter 3 verse 4 and 5 we're going to see the dialogue that the serpent had with Eve. The serpent and the devil had either turned the devil had either turned into a serpent or he had gotten in the serpent serpent because it was the wildest animal in the garden and the devil came to steal what God had created in the relationship he made with Adam and Eve. Listen to the verse. The devil said in verse 4 of chapter 3 he told and he said to the woman you shall not surely die. Verse 5 he said but God knows as soon as you eat of this tree and you of this fruit you shall be as God's knowing the difference between good and evil. Look what the devil did. God had created Adam and Eve for fellowship. They were going through the garden. They were happy and blissful at the end of chapter 2. But right there at the beginning of chapter 3 was the downfall, the sin that came for us, the sin that pegged all mankind came because of them listening to the twisted words of Satan. And this is how the devil does it. Write this down because he's doing it to you right now. Trying to steal your joy right now. Here's what he does. First he brings you doubt about God's word. God didn't say you, you couldn't. You're going to surely die. And then he, after speaking that, he said, well, God knows. Not only after bringing doubt about God, then he wants to know, is God fair? God knows that if you eat it, you'll become knowledgeable and be as God's. And then he even says, God's an out and out liar. Because if you eat from that tree of good and eat tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall know the difference between good and evil. And he twisted it around and man fell. He took that relationship in the garden. You know the devil always throws things in your mind to try to get you separated from God. He does this constantly. Look at some of the things the devil has done where he twisted it around and we don't get the benefit of it. I'm going to hit one right now that everybody knows about. Money. The world has money all messed up. The, the, the church is all messed up. The world is talking about the church don't want anything but money. The world has seen the church as being greedy and always wanting money. And that lie came from the devil because what the devil did, stay with me, he propped up these, you know, he told the lie that all Christians are supposed to be rich and, and we're supposed to be rich and everything we have, we're supposed to be able to get whatever we want, name it, claim it, say it, get it. And he's got this lie going around where we're going after money. And then he raises up prosperity preachers who talk about nothing but money, but they don't say what God's real purpose for money is. They twist it all around and start talking about money in the sense that we, remember I said in the worldly sense, when what the world calls riches is not true riches. We already had that. Come on, you already had your liquor. You already had your joints. You already had your sex. You already had what the world calls riches. Good cars. A good car can't help you at night. Amen, somebody. Some of y'all sitting in a nice house right now. Vacuum clean. Laundry done. And you still feel bad because it's what happens on the inside. The real riches of God are uh, peace in my mind. The real riches of God is health. For me and my family, the real riches of God is when I can go through a day and know that God is working on my case. The real riches is when the enemy is on me. Somebody's here right now. 
But you can shout anyway, because you know, even though the devil has you, he won't have you for long, because you got a God working on your side. Can somebody at least shout, I know God is working this thing out. That's what real riches are. But the world tells us now, when you see a, a preacher riding around in a decent car, he must be stealing from the church. Or you see a a pastor, you know, with a nice shirt on. I don't know what they... So what he does, he tries to twist it around. So now the world goes to the opposite extreme. It says, well, if you're going to be a Christian, you got to be poor and humble. But God's real purpose for money, watch this, three purposes to satisfy. God said, I will supply all of your needs. Write it down. Don't go after money. But he said, I'll supply all your needs. He said, I'll make sure you have something to give so you can help the poor. And I will show you, if you live as a good steward, how I will keep you. And you will be able to bring me glory by the way I take care of you. That's the real purpose. 2 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, money's not bad. Because that verse says, 2 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. And they who covet, go after it, they covet it. It says they strayed from the faith and they have brought sorrow into their own heart. So the devil uses money. The last thing I'll tell you about the devil uses, I can keep going on. He uses sex. Come on. Uh, uh, he uses sex. The world, I don't know, you can't turn on the TV and see anything without seeing it sold by sex. Sex sells because they made us think sex is a God. As a matter of fact, they'll make you believe that sex is the answer to all your problems. I just need a companion. I just need to be intimate. And that will not get you to where you find God's divine best for your life. Quit longing for that and make sure the devil will try to tell you sex is a God. As a matter of fact, the pornography industry is a $10 billion industry that has, watch this, that makes more money than all three of the major sports. The NBA, the NFL, and the MLB. Major League Baseball, Major League Football, Major League Basketball. They, the, they make more money because sex sells. When God told us to flee sexual immorality. I really can't talk about sex. I can really talk about that and give you some. And, and I may have to do another message on that. But what I need to focus on today is something that can take your life to a new level. The writer of the Psalms. The one who loved God, the one who gives us words that help us in the midnight hour when it, when it says that the Lord is close to those of a contrite spirit and a broken heart. David has helped all of us. I will lift my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Well, David is also showing us, and I say without contention, stay with me. We need to understand that the devil, the, devil, the enemy, has twisted the reality of what God calls dance or dancing. that was created by God. Remember, God created it. The devil tried to steal it. He is an imposter. Uh, he, he's an imposter. He, he, he's a cheat. He's a con artist. He goes around and flips things around so we can't get the blessing. And I will tell you, listen to me right now, those of you who don't dance and don't understand, and you may not understand because I haven't gotten there yet, but real dancing, how God described it, dance that came out of the heart of God for the celebration of God comes to a place that it will bring you. If you dance and understand spiritual dance, please follow me. You will see that there's an emotional recovery to dance. Dance is a form of worship to God. And it's an extraordinary form because it gets you moving your whole body in rhythm to the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I'm about to go somewhere. Don't shut me off yet because I'm going to show you scripturally that dance can bless us. Dance will take us to a new height in God. If we're dancing in worship to God, it means that there's been a spiritual overflow on the inside. You can't tell me that starting to move because there's a, a, a unction of the Holy Spirit coming up in you and hands go. And the scripture tells us, lift up holy hands. And the scripture tells us about dance. Let me show you today how the devil has distorted, stolen, and messed up dance. I'm going to teach you how to dance your way out of the darkest spiritual battle you're going through. Because we need to understand our text, verse 14, said, David danced before the Lord with all his might. How do you do that? And God still using. How do you do that? And I'm condemned. I want to answer the big three questions. Stay with me. 
Here are the questions that get on our mind. Is it a sin to dance? Does the Bible condemn dancing? And can we dance in the church? Is it a sin to dance? Does the Bible condemn dancing? And can we dance in the church? The answer to all three of those questions is yes and no. Here's the first one. Is it a sin to dance? Yes. If you are dancing erotically, lewdly, if you're dancing just uh, using, calling attention to your body and yourself, if your motive for the dance is wrong, it will send you to a place where you are a pawn for Satan because the erotic dancing and the movements takes you straight to darkness. So the first answer is yes, it's a sin to dance if you dance like that. But no, it's not a sin to dance if you're dancing to give expression of worship unto God. So you got to watch that. Stay with me. If you're worshiping God, okay, does the Bible condemn dancing? No, the Bible doesn't condemn dancing if the dancing is done out of your deep, deep desire to get closer, to express yourself, to express God's love for you, to express how you feel about your Savior. But yes, the Bible condemns dancing again if it is sensuous. If it is done for the wrong purpose and the wrong motive, the Bible condemns dancing. And the last question is, can we dance in church? That's the big one. Can we dance in church? And the answer is, yes, we can dance in church because God has said that we can. God is almost, I don't want to use the word commanded, but he told us to dance. And not only that, no, we can't dance if it, again, is inappropriate movement and motions. Let's talk about that. What are you talking about, Pastor? Let me read some Bible. Psalms 150. You know the psalm. It says, uh, Praise you, the Lord. Watch this. Praise God in the sanctuary. Verse 1. Psalms 150, verse 1. So we're talking about, we just entered the church. We're in the sanctuary. If you travel down to verse 4, it says how to praise God in the sanctuary. And it says, Praise Him in temple and in dance. So God said, when you're praising me, it's good to get music and to dance because your thoughts are on me. And then, if we go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 22, we find the dark, an explanation of why dancing the world has done, has gotten to the point that it connects them with the Satan, with the kingdom of Satan. Here's why. You look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, Herodias and King Herod. Herodias used to be King Herod's brother's wife, and he took her. And John the Baptist was going around telling about it, so she didn't like John the Baptist. So she got her daughter, watch this, in chapter 6, to dance before the Lord because the king had promised her, uh, if you come dance for me sensuously, anything you ask, I will give you. And the Bible says, here's what verse 22 says, and she danced before the king, and she pleased the king and his guests. And at the end, you know, with their tongues hanging out, they looked and said, whatever you want, I'll give you. And the devil took advantage of that sensuous moment and said, I want the head of John the Baptist. And all of a sudden, the dance went into the work of Satan because it was not done for the right purpose. But real dancing, the Bible tells us God said to do. How do I know? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 4 says, There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. So God himself said there's a time we should be dancing. Exodus chapter 15 verse 20, we find out that after the children of Israel came across out of Egypt, Marion, the text says in verse 20, verse 20 it says, Marion the prophet is the sister of Aaron. Look at the verse, Exodus 15, 20. It says that she grabbed her temple and all the women lined up and they celebrated God's victory. Dance can get you to celebrate God's victory. Dance is when you have a victory to celebrate. It can wake up your, your, your spirit to get close to God. Let's look at this text. I'm going to show you. I was... Look at hundreds of songs about dancing. Uh, Hezekiah, come on, let's dance. Dance with me. Get up out of your seat. I was looking at Fred Hammond. 
Uh, when the spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David danced. But then this one song hit me. You can call it second if you will. But to me, it really matched up with what the heart of God's wishes about dance is. It's called, I hope you dance. And the song says, I hope you never lose your sense of wonder. Get your fill to eat, but always keep your hunger. That you never take one minute for one breath for granted. And the, the words go on to say, and it goes through and it goes through. I hope you uh, never fear the mountains in the distance. And I hope when one door closes, another open. It goes into all of these things. And well, here's a key, the key word. It says, and if you get the choice to sit it out or dance, I hope you dance. My brother, my sister, listen to me right now. I don't care how many demons are on you. My brother and sister, I don't care how many times the devil told you it's over. I hope you don't decide to dance. You can either be a dancer or a quitter. You can get up and start moving yourself by lifting your hands and worshiping God. Or you can sit there and cry. You can shake yourself right now and you can shake off some devils. You can shake yourself right now and awaken the spirit of God on the inside. You know what Paul told Timothy? Stir up. How do you stir something up on the inside? Too many people are sitting messed up because they won't do what God said. I'm going to show you today that if you can catch this understanding about the spirit of dance, that you will be blessed by God if you understand the spirit of dancing. Let's go into it. Let's go into it. So David is now, well, let me give you three points first. The first point is you have to desire to get into the presence of the Lord. The second point is, when you fall, get back in the presence of the Lord. If you're going to be a dancer, desire to get in the presence of God. When you fall, get back in the presence of God. And the third point is, give up worrying about what people think. In our text right here, David has now been made the king over unified Israel. Uh, he had been the king of Judah. But if you go back to chapter 5, Saul's son, who had been the king over Israel, Ishabah, um, Ishib, Ibosheth, there it is, Ibosheth, had been king, and then he died, and the men said, we got to go, and they made David king. If you go to the fifth chapter, you'll find out David was made king, and then God's anointing was with him. He defeated the Philistines, several battles of the Philistines. When the land was quiet, chapter 6, David came together, and if you look, David said, the verse says, verse 1, And David again gathered all of the men, the mighty men of Israel, and they came together so they could go and get the Ark of the Covenant of God to bring it back to Israel. Uh, it was there because of the Lord of hosts who sat beneath the cherubims. Now understand the language David is telling us. Here is what happened. David now was made king. And he said, I've been through battles, but you know what? If I'm going to do this thing right, with all the ups and downs I had, I got to make sure that I am in the presence of God. I got to make sure God is on my side. I got to make sure I got God with me. This will not work if God is not with me. So we went and got the Ark of the Covenant. If you go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7, you'll find out the Philistines had left the Ark of the Covenant in the bed of Dad's house. And David said, while Saul was king, Saul didn't think about the ark. But David said, I got to bring the ark of God. In the ark of God was the anointing of God. It was the jar of golden manna. It was Aaron's beard that, I mean, rod that budded. And it was the two tablets of the Ten Commandments that God had restored. Everything representing God's power. Here's what he said. I'm not going to start to try to be this king on this new thing without a fresh new anointing. Can I stop? The reason some of you are in the same place because you're living off of yesterday's anointing. You're trying to live off. Every time you go to God, it's about what you already did. What are you doing now? You ought to know that you need, for a new venture, you need a new, you need a new deliverance. You need some new scripture. You need some new praise. How many of you are looking back and you get angry because a trial comes and you start thinking about how you got out before. God said, that's all good, but you need a fresh anointing. Don't be satisfied with what happened before. Can I tell you, that's why every day when you get up, that's the day you ought to worship God. Do you know the devil is counting on you, living off of what happened last week, 
week or two months ago, or you can say, and as you go through that, you know, we, we get saved, and when we, when we first get saved, we want all we can of God, then we kind of get used to God, and we wonder what happens. Here's what happens. The devil brings some new demons in, and you're trying to fight that new demon with a leftover spirit. Well, I got out of this before. No! You got to have a fresh. What are you doing for God now? Well, when is the last time? When is the last time you sat down and memorized scripture? When is the last time you sat there and in God's presence just worshipped him till you felt that anointing so you knew there was something different between you and the rest of the world? No, what happens is trial comes and we start trying to say, oh, and, and if we don't have anything in us, we start whining. David said, no, I'm not going to go if God don't go with me. Which the next thing happened. Many of us, many of us, we, we try to, We've done things and didn't ask God. Just did it because that's what we want to do. We thought it was right. And now you're sitting there with the results of it and you want God to bless you through it. Some good preacher, stay with me. And you're wondering why you're in that condition. I need you to go back in your mind and think about when you went and God said, don't go. Think about when you moved and God said, stand still. I'm going to tell you right now, God saved me from myself. I remember it as if it was yesterday. I've been preaching and I wrote a couple of books and I'm sitting there talking and, and, and I start getting all these engagements out and I was going to these big churches and I, and I was at one church preaching and the Lord came down and it was a blessing and there were some people there from another church that heard me and they gave, here's how they messed me up, gave me a packet, said we're looking for a pastor, we don't have a pastor, if you're interested, here's a packet, they, didn't, they weren't sending you know email, they just handed it to me and I looked and it was a big big, big, beautiful church and, you know, uh, 1,500 members and growing in a nice suburbs and they had money and I looked at all the vans laid up in the parking lot and they wanted me to be pastor. I said, hey, God, this is good. Yeah. And all the while, nothing inside of me, my connection to God was telling me I'm supposed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I started arguing with God. You know, I was saying stuff like, well, you know, this ain't fair. Uh, uh, God, you know, I paid my dues. Look how hard I and I was doing all of that, all of that, but I knew inside God said, don't do it. But I filled out my resume, put this nice little cover letter together, all the stuff I had did. You see that? All the stuff I had did. This was all about me. And I remember going to the post office in Bridgeton, and the whole time I'm going to Bridgeton, I'm arguing with God. God, this is going to be all right. And I know God. And, da, 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 da. and I pulled into the parking lot. Because when you go around with the mailbox, it's like a horseshoe. You go in one side, and as you get to go on the other side, there's the mailbox. And I grabbed my little Nella envelope, and I was getting ready to put it in the box. And I could. God arrested me. That's how you know God loves you. When he tries to stop you. And I pulled my car over, angry. But I was so angry, tears were coming down. God, what's the matter? This ain't fair. Why can't I go? What's the matter with this? And God said a word that rattled my car. He said, I didn't tell you to go. Oh. He, he, he asked, I didn't tell you. And I said, well, God. And he continued, don't you think Shiloh needs a pastor? I mean, we were growing, the church was doing well, but you know, I just wanted to move on. And I said, yeah. And he said, that's what I told you to do. And if you do it, you will get a better reward or just as big a reward as a person in the biggest church in this world because you'll be in my will and I will be with you. Don't you miss that? Here's where your power came from. Your power didn't come from your hairdo. Your power didn't come from how many amens you said. Your power didn't come from how cute you are. Your power came because you were in God's will and God was with you. And how many know God is with you? It don't against you. Two things scared me and made me tear it back it up. He said, first of all, I didn't tell you and I don't want to go anywhere that I didn't tell me to go. And the second thing that messed me up is when he said, and if you stay in my will, I'll be with you. David knew this. Look at the text. Because the Bible said, he went and got the ark of God, which continued to tear him. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts. See, David knew what it meant to have God's power. Oh, you better stay with me. The Bible says that the Lord of hosts, that's, G, that's God's battle name. Right now, you're in a position that you need the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is God's battle name. When you see the word Lord, all capital L-O-R-D, 
14. It means Yahweh. That's God redemptive power. That's his uh, self-existing nature. So when you see Lord, and then when you see the word host, that is his angelic battle. That is the angelic host. The word host is telling us that it's an army of God. He has an angel army that he sends down to bless us. Oh, somebody about to get excited. Then whenever you stand in God's will and you start calling on God, if you took your spiritual eye, there are angels all around you blessing you. Somebody ought to get happy right now because David knew if I can get the Lord of hosts, David had been through battles. He had destroyed the lion. He had fought the lion. He had fought the bear. And every time he turned around, he got victory. That little one-sided. But it's never one-sided when the Lord of hosts is on your side. The Lord of hosts. Remember the story of Elisha. King Aram was warring against Israel. And every time Elisha would tell the army of Israel where he was hiding in ambushments. And the king got angry and said, who's telling? We, we got a rat in our troop. Who's telling? And they said, no, nah, that's that prophet Elisha. And the king said, go find him. And they heard he was in Dothan. And he they went out and he sent troops and they surrounded the city. Watch this. And the next morning, Elisha's servant got up after cooking breakfast and he threw the water out and looked up and surrounding Elisha and his servant was an army from King Aram. And he ran back in the house. He said, Master, Master, what are we going to do? And Elisha walked confidently out the door. And he said, don't worry. Watch these words. They that be with us is more than be with them. Now, don't make me preach that. I got to move on. Y'all know I get excited. Every time I'm in a battle, I got to know that the greater one is with me. As a matter of fact, take about two seconds and tell yourself, this is heavy, but I got the greater power with me. Take a minute and say, it looks bad, but my God is able to overturn anything. So like I said, they that be with us be more than them. And then he looked at him and said, you can't see it. He said, open his eyes. And they opened up his servant's eyes and he looked across the hill. Can you see this? And he saw chariots on fire and horses and the angel army standing around protecting Elisha. Oh, I got a good report for somebody. You may have tears coming down your eyes. It may look like the devil's already won. But there are angels. God is ready to send a fire to bless you, to get you out. If you only understand that you got to get into his presence. Moses understood this in Exodus chapter 33 as I move on to my next point. But I need you to see that those of us who understand how to get victory knew that we weren't going nowhere without God. Exodus chapter three, chapter 33 verse 15. Uh, God has said, okay guys, you came to that bad experience with the golden calf. Time for y'all to leave here. I'm going to send an angel ahead of you. And and. God had made the tent of meeting with Moses. He would regularly go out and meet with Moses. And a pillar, anointed pillar of cloud would come down. And the people would see God conversing with Moses. While God was out there saying, Moses, I need you to go without me. In verse 15, Moses looked at God and said, Lord, if you don't go with us, I'm not going. <laughs> now the Bible says it this way. If you, if you don't go, if you're not going, God, don't send us out of here. All Moses was saying is, Lord, I came this far because of you and I'm not going without you. Make sure you're in God's will. And secondly, not only make sure God is with you, but make sure you're with God. Look what happened. It said they put the, uh, go with me, uh, verse 3, let's go to from 3 to 7. It says they took the ark and they put it in a new cart. And they carried the ark. Uh, and it says that the sons of Abinadad, Ohio and Uzzah, were guiding and driving the ark. And they carried the ark down. And as David and the men were behind dancing, as you get the picture, it says as they were driving the ark, uh, the, the, the cart stumbled and Uzzah touched the ark. And immediately, God struck him dead. Here's the problem. When I read that, I said, God, what are you doing? But look at the text. Even David was upset that God struck him dead. But here's what happened. God said, not only must you make sure you're with me, make sure my word in you is a priority. Don't be using me last. Here's what happened. They didn't do what God told them to do. They decided to get a new car, and that's not how God said the ark should be carried. Stay with me. God said the ark is to be carried only by the Levites. When he first gave the command, it was a specific tribe of the Levites, the Kohites, but now he said it had to be a political priest. So the ark was only supposed to be carried 
Galilee on stacks uh, on each side of the ark with these round holes and you stick the poles to the holes and you put them on each side and they walk down with the ark and they can't even touch the ark or God would kill them. That's the problem. Now the enemy gets you because you always looking for something new. That's why people run around church to church when they look for the latest revelation. Somebody start doing something spooky and you jump on board when God is saying the word you have in you I'm about to give you something. You want a revolution? A revelation? Here it is. The word you have right now is enough. Stop. Right there. Get with me right there. Somebody shout with me and say the word Stay focused. 
And just as he pointed the gun at the turkey, a big deer came. And the deer was a better kill. So he turned the gun over to the deer. But all of a sudden, he heard the voice of God said, no, pray first, aim high, stay focused. So he was getting ready to turn the gun back to the turkey. But then he looked, there was a snake between his legs. He was ready to bite him. So he pointed the gun down to the snake. But he decided, I'm going to just trust God. Snake there or not. Because God said again, pray first, aim high, stay focused. And all of a sudden, he took beating on that turkey, shot. Killed the turkey. The bullet fell out of the turkey. Killed the deer. And when, the, when he got done shooting, the gun handle fell off. Dropped on the head of the snake. Dropped him back into the lake. And when he looked around, he had fish in his pocket. Now because the man stayed focused, because he was going through that, he still trusted God. But here's what he did. He found out, I got a rabbit. I mean, excuse me, I got a, a deer. I got a turkey. And I got fish to feed my family. And the snake, watch this, here's what, had no power over me because I And if you stay focused on God, he'll bless you. That takes us to our last point. The Bible said, a report came back to David. The house of Obed-Edom has, Obed has been blessed. Y'all, you should see all the blessings because he got the ark of God. And David knew it was a sign because he hadn't given up to go get the ark. Here's our point. I'm going to very close to follow the text. And David said, they went and got the ark. And this time, you better believe, they carried it right. And they were carrying it to see. And David was so happy that God came through. Here's my last point. Quit worrying about what people think. That the Bible said when they went six paces, here's where it happened. All David been through just flushed inside of him. And the Bible said, and I can see it, David danced before the Lord with all his heart. What he did was muster up all the joy. What went through his mind is all the nights I've been through, all the days God showed up. The stuff you don't know about or nobody else knows about. And the joy just caused him to lose it. And the Bible said with all of his might. That means he went into a good old shout. Giving God glory. So much so to all the people were dancing around. And the Bible said then they were so happy that they had a party. Sometimes you can have a party right where you are. You and God and the Holy Spirit. And it said out of that, he gave everybody some meal, you know, some food and a flag of wine. And they just danced. And all of a sudden, David prayed and gave sacrifices. He worshipped. All of that happened. But here's the part we need to see. His wife, Michael, was looking out the window. You know how folk like to kill your joy. That's when joy kills around. They're looking to find something on you, or they're looking to mess you up, so they want to kill your joy. So it says that all of a sudden, Michael looked, and when David came home, he was getting ready to bless his house. He was getting ready to bless his house. He was getting ready to bless his house. But she said, ah, oh, look at you. Isn't this something how the king paraded around like he was doing in front of all the servants out there, belittling yourself? And I want you to see what David said unto her. Three things, and I'm closing. Read the text. First of all, I will tell you, please don't worry if other folk don't dance. Please don't worry if other people look at you and don't want you to dance. If you're getting blessed, I hope you dance. Just tell them, I'm going to dance and not give up. I'm going to dance and not quit. I'm going to dance because God is worthy. And David told her, first of all, I'm not worried about what you said. So first of all, I didn't think about you. But then he gave her his reasons for dancing. He said, number one, I'm dancing because God chose me, brought me forth when I didn't deserve it. One of the things that makes you dance is when you can recognize I may be in trouble now, but the God I serve has never left me in trouble. I may be in trouble now, but God chose me when I wasn't worthy to be chosen. Where are the people that would be honest if you knew some of the stuff I did even now? I'm not worthy, but God chose. Well, this should make you shout right here. God chose you. Why you? You ain't better than nobody else. He chose you and he gave you favor. He chose you. David said, what makes me dance is to know I'm chosen. This world is not my home, but the God who loves me chose me. And the next thing David said, I love this. He said, not only was I chosen by God, he said, but he chose me above your brother, the royal family. I was just a lowly shepherd. He picked me up out of nowhere. When you think of where God brought you from, it makes you dance. And then he said, and, I love this part, 
He said, and you really haven't seen anything yet. Do you think I worry how I look? Do you see what David said? He said, look, I don't care how I have to belittle myself to bring glory to God. I don't care if I tear my face up. I don't care if I got to shout in front of royalty, in front of folk who think they high up the ups and muggy mucks. I don't care who you are. When I think of the goodness of Jesus, I will begin to dance. Some of y'all can't get your blessing because you're worried about what other people think. Man, if God hits you, give God a praise right where he hits you. Give God a dance right where he hits you. Give God a dance because he's worthy. Here's what I'm saying this message said. I hope when you get your chance to sit it out, I hope you say, I'm not sitting down now. Devil, you picked the wrong person to choose. You messed with the wrong person today because I choose to dance. I hope you dance. When you get a chance, either sit it out, give up, quit, or dance. Somebody shout, I'm going to dance. My days aren't over. My dancing days are still ahead of me. And I'm going to give God the glory do his name. Oh, let me close with you. I hope sitting there you heard this message and seen the, 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 the anointing that God has placed on the freedom of liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. I hope you dance. I hope you put this on the inside of your heart and say, instead of crying, even if I'm crying, I'll cry while I dance. But I'll never give up. I'm going to do like David. I'm going to dance before the Lord. With all my might. Get in God's presence. Fall down, get back in God's presence. And give up on worrying about what people say. And you will be a dancer. God bless you. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down with the no way up. And I needed some help. Everybody. Breathing but not living, just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free